Hi, I'm Derek Ashong. Welcome to the stream. This is our pre-show where we have an opportunity to talk about some of the pressing issues of the day. Also, we'll be going live into our broadcast in just a few minutes, but after that, we'll be back here for the post-show where we can dive deeper into some of the issues that were raised as well as some other things. Today, I'm joined by Ahmed and Jillian. Welcome, both of you. Ahmed, there was a really interesting video that was tweeted to us over the weekend mm -hmm. um, about a, an American kid in Israel. Can you talk to us a little bit about what happened there? Yeah, a young American uh, Jew, actually, was there on Jerusalem Day, and he, I guess, staged an impromptu protest. He was just there. And what is Jerusalem? Day. Jerusalem Day is a parade that's held in Jerusalem. I mean, the actual point of this story is that he wasn't planning a protest. He was just there with his American passport in hand and perhaps being somewhat provocative. But what ended up happening is he was harassed and accused of biting and, uh, you know, kind of attacking policemen in Israel. Well, when, and when you say he was being somewhat provocative, he, right. he was wearing a, a kippah with the Palestinian with the flag, Palestinian and, the flag shirt, yeah, yeah. and the kippah. And yeah. he was being interviewed right. um, and he was making comments as to his feeling that the Israeli occupation of Palestine was wrong. Yeah, right, let's right, because Jerusalem Day, I mean, celebrates the, the conquest of East Jerusalem. Right. Mm. So it was this kind of very, very sort of tentious, or, uh, yeah, tense exactly. time. Yeah, well, I mean, we can, we can yeah. actually just yeah, let's see, see let's just play a little bit of it and see what he, see. And I'm here to say that not in my name, not in the name of the American citizens. So there you go, that's the hat with the Palestinian flag. Now, if we, if we go forward a bit, you see right here. I will not give you my passport. I, I'm not giving you my passport. I mean, I have a right to be here. I have a right to be here. Don't push me. Do I need to call my? I'm gonna call my counselor right now. Get off me. Do I need to call my counselor right now? So this. This video is quite long, but what I'm going to do is just briefly fast forward because they move him and then the video cuts to a group of uh, Israelis who are, who are, you know, counter-protesting because apparently a spontaneous protest was launched, as you can see, Palestinians there protesting behind him, but this is where the police grab him, right there. Okay, so it looks like they're treating, treating him fairly roughly. Now, what exactly was the claimed by the authorities right. uh, or the justification for this? To be honest, I didn't see any justification no, of this. No, I mean, he wrote, a, he wrote a blog post about it, and he says, mm -hmm. you know, that they were, that uh, he, he allowed himself to go limp. It was, you know, his nonviolent defiance. But he said the entire time they were just shouting curse words at him. And eventually, um, you know, I think he was, uh, he was allowed to come back home to the U.S. But uh -huh. What, what people are discussing about this is that it highlights sometimes, you know, how without real giving a reasoning or any sort of substantial mm -hmm. reason, yeah. uh, people are roughed around on an ongoing basis within, right, within let Israel. Let me ask you a favor. Can you scroll to earlier in the video yeah. to give some context? Because I want to hear some of what he said. Yeah, because yeah. Because that is beginning. allegedly why he got in trouble. Yeah. Some people are saying. Yes, let's listen to him is occupying the Palestinian people in my name, in the name of world Jewry, and I myself, an American Jew, I'm here to say that that is completely unjustified and ethically reprehensible. And we will, world Jewry and all people of the world will not stop until this occupation ends and until the Palestinian people have their right, their right of return, their right to live without occupation. I'm going to stop it because I think what's interesting is, you know, this show later on, hopefully today, we're going to be talking about freedom of expression. And we've yeah. seen stories about freedom of expression, you know, across the Arab world. And even in Israel, this is just a guy expressing his opinion. Yeah. Well, I think this is the challenge when you're talking about freedom of expression anywhere. It's that it's easy to say we live in a society that supports free expression, but it's only proven when people are expressing ideas that you don't like. Right. right, right, and this is not, I mean, we've seen things like this in other democracies as well. We mm -hmm. saw things like this in Canada around the Olympics a couple of years ago. So this is not necessarily an isolated incident, um, but, you know, I, I think that, I think it does tell us something about freedom of expression in Israel when you're, when you're portraying a, a specific side of the argument. Yeah, yeah. well, as Amit said, we've got a couple of other stories that are going to be tackling the same freedom of expression right. issue. Right. There's one other thing that I think is worth bringing up. Before we do, I just want to check and see if our Skype guest is with us and if you can hear us. Can you hear us okay? Yes. Hi. Hi, welcome. Thank you so <laughs> much for joining us. We're really f looking forward to having a conversation with you. Welcome. Thank you to you. Absolutely. So we're going to get the show started in just a few, and then we'll introduce you briefly, give the audience a little bit of context, and then get to find out a little bit more about what's happening down in Bahrain. Thank you. Okay, we'll be with you in a sec. Thanks. So um, the, there's another story that we heard about that is coming out of Kenya. Right. Um, and apparently it came out just this morning. 
Can you talk a little bit about what happened there? Yeah, this, this story broke on Twitter, uh, and we were hearing about it since this morning, as you said, and still today, as you can see, updates uh, as recently as 23 minutes ago kind of unfolding. Basically, what happened is there were deaths in what is being called another Nairobi building collapse. So mm. this is uh, yeah. a common occurrence. There's infrastructure problems in Kenya, and that's what people are discussing. Um, the deputy chief, as you can see right here in this tweet, uh, of the mission in Kenya is saying that the GHI building, which is the one that fell, is on existing platforms. Like, basically what happened is several people died. So there's two mm -hmm. people who are dead, 14 missing, and a lot of people raising questions as to why this keeps happening. Well, one of the things that's interesting about the story is that apparently the building was not completed, but people were already living there. At right. least this is from what I've read thus far. Yeah. The other interesting thing is it's apparently been built on a wetlands area, like a sort of a swampy terrain, right. Right. which is not really good for having a building be secure and standing. And so the argument that a lot of people are making is that mm -hmm. this building fell because of corrupt decisions being made in the government, whereby they're building in areas where they shouldn't be. Safety concerns right. were not considered. People are allegedly moved in even when the building is not uh, complete and poor people are dying. And apparently this has happened a few times. Right. I mean, Julian, what do you think about it? I mean, it's a breaking story, so we're still learning more about what happened, but we had a conversation about corruption yesterday, and it seems like sometimes these decisions get made where it's the, uh, it's the, the powerless or the people without the strongest voice who wind up bearing the brunt of it. Right, exactly. And you've got usually, you know, sort of an underclass who's actually building these buildings. Mm -hmm. It's obviously not their fault. You know, they're dealing with um, limited finances and limited materials. But yeah, I mean, I, what I've read is that um, they're actually they're having a really hard time uh, even rescuing because of the, the shoddy workmanship of the buildings. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's definitely something for us to, to keep our eyes on. And right. it's good that we saw it on Twitter. But it's interesting how some of these stories are advanced more quickly on social media than apparently through right. traditional right. forms. Wouldn't have gotten attention otherwise. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this is good. Uh, we're going to be jumping right into our main broadcast in just a moment. We're going to ask you to stay with us the whole way through to the post show. There are going to be some interesting issues brought up there. We're going to be talking about Somalia, but we're starting out in the Gulf region for today's broadcast. Stay tuned. We'll see you in a few. Hi, I'm Derek Ashong, and you are now in The Stream, a social media community with its own daily TV show. We're bringing you stories that are ongoing, global, and sourced from social media. Today, authorities in Kuwait, Kuwait and Bahrain hit back against online dissent. And Canada's tar sands, a cyber campaign grows against what many are calling the world's dirtiest oil. As always, our digital producer, Ahmed Shahab El Din, is here looking out for your feedback. Also returning to the couch is Jillian York, Director of International Freedom of Expression at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. It's an organization that monitors and defends free speech and privacy online. Jillian, it's so good to have you here. We've been talking a little bit in the pre-show about these issues of free speech. How do you think about the defense of free speech in an international context when different countries have different laws? Right. Well, so for me, it's based off of Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But obviously, this is not something uh, ratified or respected by all countries. And so for me, I think, you know, you really have to look at it as sort of a universal framework. Okay. So basically, this is going to be an area where we're going to hopefully rely on your insight a little bit because the first story that we're starting with today has a lot to deal with these right. issues of freedom of expression. Remember, you can always have your say on our stories at our website, stream.aljazeera.com. I am Umed Babakhanov. I am founder and editor-in-chief of Asia Plus Media Group. And I'm part of the stream. Another clampdown against dissent on social media in the Middle East. Dozens of students studying at the Bahrain Polytechnic were expelled from the school for expressing their views about democracy and the state of emergency in that country. And in Kuwait, netizens are rallying behind a young Shia man who was arrested for his tweets last week criticizing the Sunni governments of Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. If you'll take a look at this photo I have right here, 
26-year-old Nasser Abul, the man in blue in this picture, is the first Kuwaiti citizen to be arrested for dissenting on social media. Kuwaiti officials say Abul insulted ally nations, claiming his messages could hurt international unity. And in Bahrain, we've got the case of a student, Noor Al-Darazi, that is particularly puzzling. The Bahrain Polytechnic expelled her, saying she posted political messages on Facebook and took part in pro-democracy marches. However, there's something that is absolutely worth noting in this particular case. What makes it so puzzling is she says she was out of the country at that time and has even shown copies of her airline tickets, as you can see, to prove her point. But authorities there are not backing down. She was expelled from school along with a number of other students. She actually took the step of posting a letter on Facebook, uh, which she calls a letter I wrote on Facebook to the CEO of Bahrain Polytechnic. What makes this story interesting is basically she you would think, why would she post the letter on Facebook if she wanted it to go to the right. CEO of the school? Right. Well, she was uh, investigated allegedly and presented during this investigation by school authorities with printouts of comments she had made on her Facebook page the idea being that perhaps her page was hacked right and or that one of her friends turned it over you never know no. absolutely well this is the thing there's about 80 students that are being said to be investigated but 30 have been uh, you know dozens as you said have been you know expelled so far and when I spoke to her the story broke yesterday that you know everyone in Bahrain was talking about it on Twitter this is a tweet from her even though she was unable to join us today she said specifically what bothered her is that she didn't like having to explain to her university and justify what she calls private posts on Facebook she says she didn't make a blog mm -hmm. she didn't post them they were on her Facebook well and she also in her letter to her, uh, the president of her university she says that she has very strong Facebook settings or privacy settings right. whereby only her friends can see what's on her page. Right. Now we did invite her to be with us. We invited Noor to join us on the stream today. Unfortunately, she pulled out at the last minute and I think this is a testament to the sensitivity mm -hmm. of some of these issues. However, joining us now via Skype is Mohammed Al Maskati. He's the director of the Bahrain Youth Society for Human Rights. Mohammed, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the stream. Welcome. So Mohammed, tell us what is the issue here why is it that these students appear to have caught the ire or be gaining a problem from the university? Actually, uh, today uh, I met with uh, uh, different students, some of them from bah Bahrain Polytechnic and some of them from the Bahrain uh, uh, University. Uh, uh, most of them, uh, they get investigations about what uh, they wrote and uh, uh, and the social media, uh, especially in the Facebook. Uh, uh, they told me that uh, uh, some of them, they, they, their Facebook is, is, is closed, is not open for everyone. So how they are can have uh, take their post it and print it and bring it to their, uh, to, to their investigations mm -hmm. uh, committee. Uh, uh, because I am the expert in the secure, digital security, uh, I thought is is not is uh, taken by the uh, by the security forces or by the uh, from the security side. But I think someone from uh, from their side who are uh, trying to be a friend and he printed everything to the investigations committee. Okay, and this is uh, the point that Jillian was making that it could be one of their friends. Now I want to ask you, Mohammed. It would seem that a university campus would be a place where freedom of speech was allowed or encouraged. Why is it that the university seems to have taken this extraordinary step of penalizing students for comments that were made in a private forum on Facebook? Uh, uh, my, my thought about that is that the university want to uh, punish everyone who will participate in a pro-democracy uh, protest or or write anything to support the protest uh, uh, from 14 February, uh, especially that uh, uh, the student who are uh, uh, like like uh, at Dorazi, she she was outside the country, so she not uh, she not uh, uh, she not to participate in the protest. Uh, we have uh, one one student. She is Asma Darwish. As much she on hunger strike because uh, her uh, her uh, uncle and cousin and brother arrested during the 
the crackdown. Uh, she also uh, she also dismissed from the Bahrain uh, Polytechnic. Now, so, Mohammed, uh, let me give uh, some context to our viewers really quickly. When you say that Noor was out of the country, basically Noor was accepted for a uh, a program via the U.S. Embassy in Bahrain uh, that was sponsored by the State Department. She was in Minnesota mm -hmm. doing this particular program for women's leadership. She was one of only five women selected from across right. the country of Bahrain. Right. And so, Jillian, this brings us to an interesting point where she has evidence that she was outside of the country, but she's being punished for having participated allegedly in protests that took place while she was gone. W what, what does this say about the status of freedom of expression in Bahrain? Well, this is a tricky one. And, you know, I, I have to say, I, I wonder, and I, I hope it's okay to ask our guest, um, I wonder if her participation in this program, in this leadership program, had anything to do with their, their going after her in particular. One quick thing I wanted to go ahead. Go ahead, Mohammed. Yeah, please. actually, actually, uh, uh, we we spoke today in the meeting uh, that what they the student can do, uh, we suggest them to uh, connect the uh, uh, UN uh, Human Rights Commission and the international organizations, especially that international organizations facing uh, focusing in the freedom of expression. Uh, and this case is not uh, it's not an uh, example case because we have only f uh, three days ago uh, a cyber activist uh, arrested from his uh, house because he have uh, a Facebook group uh, uh, broadcasting information about the protest in the village. Mm -hmm. And no one no one know that uh, cyber activist. He used a nickname and he used Bahrain Hussein Hussein Bahrain. Uh -huh. No one know him. And he arrested, uh, and he, they take uh, his pass, his uh, password, and when they take his password, they control the Twitter and the Facebook pages, and now this Twitter and Facebook pages turn to the uh, pro uh, pro government uh, uh, pages. You know, Ahmed, this is interesting because we're seeing these cases are kind of related. On the one hand, you have people like Noor who were kicked out from Bahrain Polytechnic. The other hand, we told you earlier about Nasser Abul in Kuwait, right. who was kicked out not for saying anything about the Kuwaiti government, mm -hmm. but for his comments about the... Um, the right. uh, what was happening in Saudi Arabia Saudi, and in right. Bahrain, right. and it seems like there's almost this uh, partnership between the GCC countries, perhaps to stifle certain kinds of dissent. Yeah, no, definitely. And something we just want to share with you, and a quick question is: a lot of people are reporting that there are more expulsions today, including mm -hmm. Noor and uh, Maryam Al Khawaja, as you can see right here, is saying, "I'm hearing Bahrain Polytechnic expelled more students today." But the question for you um, is: you know this. Mo Tarani is saying the expulsion of students in Bahrain makes it look like education is only a reward for people who are loyal to the government. So we have even the actual expulsion letter has been tweeted to us for our Arabic speaking viewers who want to see this. We'll be tweeting this out. But what do you make of this? Is this really positioning education as a reward for people who are going to be obedient perhaps to the government? Actually, uh, uh in Bahrain University is more complicated because in Bahrain University you cannot be a student uh, without sign a pledge to give your loyalty to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the authorities. So if you want to be a student, you need to sign this pledge and say I am support the government. Uh, uh, we we document these cases before and uh, uh, we told. Uh, we get information that uh, who is not signed this uh, pledge, is, he is get uh, beaten maybe, or he he get to be uh, dismissed from the uh, Bahrain uh, University. Uh, about about the letter from ba Bahrain Polytechnic, they don't mention anything about Facebook or social media. They mm -hmm. say you are trying to uh, protest illegal. You are trying to uh, 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 step down the regime. Uh, you have you're trying to uh, attack the uh, the royal family, and that's uh, most of the of the accused against the uh, the student. Mohammed, uh, we're we're out of time for this story, but I want to thank you for joining us and for giving us some insight into what's happening on the ground there in Bahrain. We really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you to you and thank you to the Jazeera. It's interesting to look at both of these stories where you see these significant responses. On one hand, students expelled in Kuwait, a man arrested 
Right. None of these people has been accused of committing a crime, or right. at least they're being accused of crimes, but not crimes in the way we would traditionally see. Right. I think these are ones worth uh, stories worth continuing to monitor. You can find out more details about both what's happening in Bahrain and Kuwait on our website, stream.aljazeera.com. You're also going to find there many more stories with videos and images. And of course, if you want to tell us your stories, as always, tweet us at AJStream. We rely on you, our online community, to help keep us informed. Hi, my name is Saul. I use social media for promoting peace in Mexico, and I'm in the stream. Ami, um, talk to us a little bit about what kind of things people have been saying to us in the stream. Well, we uh, yesterday did a story about Macedonia. There was a young man who was murdered, and allegedly a lot of people in Macedonia think that this was a cover-up. Okay. Um, so what happened is, you know, we have been receiving, since we did that story, lots of feedback, including photographs um, about that actual story. We're just going to share very quickly because we want to follow up on the stories that we cover. As you can see right here, there's, um, this is the Storify that we had put together, and we've received lots of comments, including these photo galleries. Um, we want to just highlight them. We'll be tweeting them out. If you want to see uh, what these photos show, it's basically just more protests on day five and day seven of this story. So this is, in a nutshell, uh, in response to the story we did during the body of the show yesterday, right. people have been sending all of this feedback on the website. Right, and as you can see, these are the photos of just today. There's still tons and tons of people in Macedonia who are taking to the streets to make sure that police corruption is addressed. Now, I understand we're going to be having a special show this week that will be able to enhance some of this audience feedback. Right. So the whole concept is we want to really make sure that we keep you engaged. So this Thursday, we're doing a special show focused on feedback from you. So if you have any news that you think we should cover, you can help us do it. You can actually create a story for the stream using the actual tool that we use called Storify. You can pull together elements from all across social media, videos, photos, audio and put together a story and we may actually take it to air on Thursday. So if you don't know what Storify is, we have a video to help you understand how to do it. So this is a clip that actually shows people how to create their own Storify. We're getting very high tech here, Jillian. Right. Yeah, that was <laughs> With the information. It's funny because <laughs> yesterday we were talking about how do you make it possible for people to know how to do this, and Ben put together something that I think is really amazing that breaks it down in simple terms. So here it is. This is how you can do what we do. Storify is a narrative tool for the social media age. Log in with your Twitter account. Search what people are saying on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, pretty much anywhere on the web, then rearrange them any way you like. Add your own explanations and thoughts, and publish your story for the world to see. Share those stories with us, and they, and you, might just wind up in the stream. It's called by many the dirtiest oil in the world. Critics allege the crude Canada produces from its tar sands in Alberta comes at a heavy environmental cost. The oil is extracted from a sludge using methods that activists say is destroying the landscape and polluting rivers. Now, an online campaign in Canada is urging people around the world to observe June 18th as Stop the Tar Sands Day. Take a look at this particular screen I have here. It shows you um, the size of these Athabasca oil sands. It's a very significant piece of land, and I just want to play this video that gives some additional visual context to what we're talking about. This is what large areas of northern Alberta look like after the earth is scooped up to be mined for oil. The crude deposits cover an area approximately the size of England. In addition to this obviously um, you know, barren landscape, and, and, and to give perspective, a lot of this land is land that was used, uh, actually forest. Uh, they had to cut down trees and clear a lot of area for this, but there's more than simply that. If you'll take a look at this image I'm pulling up here in my screen, this is of a fish if you can take a look a little bit closer, you'll see that he has got two mouths, a lower jaw and a second lower jaw. Activists say that carcinogens have been dumped into the rivers, it's destroying the fish, and it's making local communities sick. Joining us now via Skype from Ottawa to give us some more perspective on this is Canadian Indigenous activist Clayton Thomas Muller, who organizes communities against tar, sand, oil. Clayton, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the stream. How long has this been an issue in Canada? Well, <clears throat> I think that the trajectory of tar sands, you know, being an economically viable form of, uh, you know, economic development for Canada uh, can be followed directly at par with the, you know, violence going on in the Gulf. 
um, you know, with destabilization of OPEC producing regions and driving up the international price of oil, it's made this extremely energy and water and social capital intensive form of development economically viable. When oil is trading above $55 per barrel, um, you know, they can actually make money off of this. Um, it's, it's not even proper, though, to call it oil. It's an entirely different classification of fossil fuel unto itself and essentially represents truly the scraping of the bottom of the barrel of, uh, of peak oil production globally. Now, you make an interesting point about how the, lo the uh, current global trends affect, affect the price because, as we understand, it takes about two to three uh, barrels of oil is the cost to produce a barrel, two or three dollars per barrel um, in Saudi Arabia, but it's thirty dollars per barrel in, uh, for these tar sands. So it's only when it's costing sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety dollars a barrel that it becomes profitable. What's the impact that this is having on indigenous communities? Well, the impacts are many. I mean, many local community leaders, you know, ha through common sense and traditional ecological knowledge can put two and two together. As indigenous peoples uh, living in the north who heavily subsidize their diet off of country foods, in other words, foods from the lands, um, you know, communities like Fort Chippewan, 250 kilometers downstream from the Athabasca uh, tar sands boomtown, Fort McMurray, have experienced tremendous rates of cancer and autoimmune deficiencies. And this is a sleepy village of predominantly uh, Aboriginal people, about 1,200 people, who have seen over 100 deaths, health-related deaths, in the last decade, um, you know, which many feel are, are linked to tar sands and their toxic footprint in their lands. Now, Clayton, I want to play a video. I want you to hear this audio, and I'm going to pose you a question based upon it. This is a protest in 2009 that took place in London but it was made by a native Canadian. And just remind BP that we're humans, we're beautiful people, and we have the moral high ground by being here today, doing this public protest, and reminding BP of their responsibility to quit drilling in indigenous lands across the world, to quit drilling in Canada, to pull out and take, make the right choice and get out of Canada's tar sands. Okay, so basically, the question here is, she's talking about British Petroleum, BP. This is in 2009, and her concern about BP's efforts in oil sands. We saw with the BP oil spill last year, massive global attention around the issue. But people have argued that the area of impact and the number of people impacted by the mining of Canadian oil sands is much greater than the impact of the BP oil spill. Why do you think this is not getting more mainstream media coverage? Well, first of all, you know, I think comparing the tragedy of the Gulf Coast to the tragedy that is unfolding in the Canadian North um, should never happen. I think that, you know, what the Gulf Coast disaster that happened under BP's watch represents is a, 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 a systemic issue with big oil. Um, time and time again, whether it's in Nigeria, whether it's in the Amazon, uh, you know, at the hands of Chevron, or whether it's in the Gulf Coast or in Alberta at the hands of Shell or BP or any other of the global operators, big oil has proven time and time again that they externalize so many of the costs onto local communities just so that their shareholders can continue to make profit. And that includes worker safety, that includes pipeline safety and, and just op operational site safety. And we've seen time and time again, you know, our water, our earth and our air sacrifice just so that you know shareholders can continue to make profits uh, you know led by the decisions of irresponsible management of these transnational firms like British Petroleum you know um, I want to I want to get Jillian in here because Clayton raises a really interesting point that this is a global issue this happens all over the place uh, he raised the point about the Ogoni Delta in Nigeria and the impact multiple oil spills have had there you know 40 percent from what we've read 40 percent of Canada's oil exports, uh, exports are coming from coal sands. Right. They have the largest reserve of coal sands, I believe, in the world. It's the second largest oil, largest oil reserves after Saudi Arabia. When there's so much money at stake, how can people strive to deal with the environmental questions? 
Well, this is a difficult one, and I think that you know we've got to look to alternative uh, alternative forms of energy. But you know, I'm no expert on this subject. I'm really interested in listening to all of this because I think that, like you said, it's really a global issue that we really should all be kind of trying well, to engage I, I, in. Well, the reason I ask you is because of your work in dealing with sure. issues of freedom of expression and freedom of speech. Right. But you have a situation here where there, I mean, the mainstream media in Canada is not adequately reporting on this, and it seems that it's not simply an area where right. the government is saying you can't talk about this, right. but if no one is going to raise a mainstream voice, it's almost like another way of curtailing speech. Well, it's complicated when you get small groups, small you know, community organizing groups up against big companies because mm -hmm. then we see what happens when, when that's the situation. Well, you know, speaking of it being a global issue and conversations not happening enough in the mainstream media about this subject, we have TJS Desmog is saying Canada has actually been falsifying, as you've said, its greenhouse gas emissions to hide the tar sands boom. So my question to you is, do you think that social media has a role to play in, and what is that role to fill mm. the void? Absolutely, social media uh, plays a critical role, I think, in social movements that are happening today to hold big oil accountable, to hold governments that big oil has taken over, like our, our own local Harper uh, government here in Canada, who's completely in bed with big financial institutions and big oil, all in the interests of, of moving tar sands. You know, recently in Bonn, Germany, Canada was, was, was whiplashed by multiple nation states over its decision to keep tar sands emissions out of their official UN report on Canada's uh, emissions reductions. So Canada has become a rogue state of sorts, a petro state, um, I would go as far to say. And I think that what social media has done for grassroots driven campaigns to internationalize this issue and to really draw attention to the plight of local frontline communities who are experiencing the brunt of these impacts, it's punched a hole into the mainstream media. And I think there's two pieces here that we need to understand. Clayton, before well, you go to that, actually, I'm going to ask you to stay with us into the post show because we want to get deeper into that. And we also want to know where you think the June 18th protest can make a difference. We're going to ask you to stay with us. Jillian, thanks for being with us as always. We're going to continue this in the post show. Well, remember, you can learn more about the Canadian tar sands issue on Al Jazeera's documentary series, Witness, which will air the film till the last drop on June 22nd. Make sure to tune in for that. In the meantime, we will continue this online, stream.aljazeera.com. Tweet us at AJStream. We'll see you online. Hi and welcome to The Post Show. We're going to continue our conversation with Clayton about the Canadian tar sands issue. Clayton, thank you so much for being with us. I want to get deeper into this point that you were raising just moments ago about the two things that you think we should be keeping in mind. Well, one is that, you know, I think media as an industry has completely changed, and that is as a result of new technologies and social media platforms like Twitter, like Facebook, and many others have really shifted the game and have shifted the ability for the narrative being told by media to be controlled by centralized corporate forces, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's big oil or, or, or big media companies. What social media has done is it's given an opportunity for, you know, uh, grassroots activists, uh, for social movements to punch a hole through that, that, that glass ceiling that's existed for so long and to get out information to mass audiences. I know for us at the Indigenous Environmental Network, we have used social media platforms and social media releases uh, similar to the technology that you were just showcasing in the show um, you know, to really get out high resolution photos, high resolution B roll, uh, you know, to media outlets instantly. And it's really, I think, changed the game and taken some of the power from big NGOs or big industry or government and place it into the hands of the people. And so I think this has been, you know, a tremendous shift that has really helped in terms of, you know, advancing social movements. We've seen it with the, with the Arab Spring. We've seen it in many different instances um, where social media has really, you know, I don't think we've even calculated the impact that this is really going to have on political organizing, especially on issues of energy and climate justice here in Canada. 
Now, before we, we continue with this, because you <laughs> raised some really good issues, I want to bring, uh, in just a moment, we're going to have another guest joining us on the couch who is a really special person who also is going to have some interesting comments, I think, about these Arab Spring-related issues. But Jillian, you're a, sto a student, <laughs> a scholar of the Internet <laughs> and of the, the Middle East and North Africa. Well, no, I mean, what's your take? It seems yeah. like social activism is becoming so much more sophisticated in this era. Well, it's fascinating that I mean, Clayton raised the parallel between uh, you know how citizen media can take on big companies and governments. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a really interesting parallel. And I think we're kind of entering this this age of truth where you know you can't you really can't trust necessarily yeah. what media is saying. So we've got this great you know sort of complementary citizen media initiative. Yeah. Well, Ahmed has got some interesting things coming in yeah. online well, about the global impact. Of yeah. This. You know, we always talk about like the value of social media, and one thing I love to actually address is something that's very simple: is that it connects people and yes. connects yeah. issues that Absolutely. are, you know, le people who are like-minded and issues that are similar. And one way that we're doing that right here is someone's someone saying Topa, Topa Dink, uh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> It says the damage is being done here in Nigeria is enormous. They leave the water unsafe and nobody queried them after these bribes. So, you know, the issue of unsafe water, I understand that there's extremely high rates of cancer um, reported among communities that rely on local, I believe it's local water sources in, in, in this area. Yeah, I mean, Alberta Health, you know, the Alberta Government Health Department's own research has shown that cancer levels in the community of Fort Chippewan are 30% elevated compared to the general population of Alberta. And, you know, at the same time, they've given themselves five years to study this research, um, which essentially is just a delay and dupe tactic to give, you know, their primary economic driver, the tar sands, more opportunity to become more entrenched, to have more infrastructure built, more expansion into native lands, which all has cumulative impacts on the Athabasca River and other important water sources in the region. And all of this impacts, of course, local communities, indigenous communities, a lot more than others because of the sacred connection that they have through their hunting and fishing culture to that particular piece of earth. So Wait, fish, let me ask you a question on that front. Is, is this an issue that is being raised primarily by the indigenous communities or do Canadian, does Canadian society as a whole recognize the, the, the potential danger here in its impact both mm. to the environment and to the people? Well, I mean, you know, there's been all types of polling done on the tar sands, on climate change. Um, and one thing that is certain is that 70% of Albertans feel that, you know, the tar sands are being expanded much too fast and that the brakes need to be put on to allow the regulatory system to catch up to the amount of leases that they're issuing. And there has been great concern. And is it just a native uh, voice that's been coming out? No, there are all types of citizens from all over, uh, from all sectors of society who are standing up against tar sands and tar sands infrastructure, like the mega pipelines that they're trying to build uh, to Texas and across Northern British Columbia. So that brings uh, me to my next question, which is about regarding June 18th. What are you calling for in these protests? Are you calling for an end to tar sands exploration? Are you calling for better regulation? Are you calling down for uh, calling for a slowing down of leases? What is happening on June 18th and what is the desired outcome? Well, the International uh, Stop the Tar Sands Day of Action is, this is the second year that it's happening. It was initiated by concerned citizens in Europe. Um, it's spread all across the planet. You know, this is a call to stop um, this development in its tracks. I mean, one of the things that we have to understand is that, you know, this technology, this form of extraction is being sold all across the planet. There are literally a dozen countries with this type of, uh, of, of fossil fuel deposit. And Canada and big oil are trying to market this type of uh, development to places like Madagascar, Democratic Republic of Congo, Venezuela, um, and uh, multiple other locations as well. And we have to stop this development, especially in the wake of catastrophic climate change because of how CO2 intensive it is and also because of the human rights implications to local communities, especially in the South where there you know, aren't necessarily the protections in place for indigenous rights or, or even just your basic human rights. Wow. So, Jillian, again, I mean, it seems uh, I, I didn't even realize the degree to which this technology was being exported yeah. around the world. And it seems like the point that Ahmed made earlier is really salient, that the connection between people in talking about this mm -hmm. is really important because people who are in the Congo right now, people who are in Madagascar, other areas, may be listening to this program or maybe looking at the words of the work of Clayton and his colleagues and saying, perhaps we should be 
uh, intervening at an earlier stage in our homeland. Definitely. I mean, I was just looking at the website for the uh, the International Stop the Tar Sands Day movement, and I mean, you're, this is a really truly international campaign. They've even got a uh, it looks like a cosmetics company that's joining them, uh, running this campaign, I mean, Lush Cosmetics. And so, uh, you know, this this really is a global issue. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, on the, on, the, on. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, no, you bring up Lush, and that's a very exciting uh, uh, collaboration. The, the Lush is actually in partnership with IEN. We've launched a week of actions in Europe, in 21 countries across Europe, calling to keep tar sands out of Europe. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a whole uh, day of action, actually, that's taking place at every Lush shop, over 200 shops, uh, where they'll be dumping oil on Lush staff, um, or molasses, I guess, <laughs> who are draped in Canadian flags to make a statement that uh, you know, Europe needs to keep this dirty fuel out of their uh, fuel mix, and uh, you know we're doing this all with the effort at in, at um, influencing European climate legislation, known as the Fuel Quality Directive. Clayton, thank you really very much for joining us. Uh, this is a really interesting topic, and we hope to continue to learn more, and uh, and we'll be keeping an eye open on what happens on June 18th. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. See you in the streets. Absolutely. So there's another story that came to us from uh, Twitter over the weekend, and people have been sending us tons of stuff about this. And this is related to something that's been reported in the mainstream news, too. It has to do with some recent developments in Somalia, mm -hmm. and people have been protesting there based upon the move of the provisional government in Somalia mm -hmm. to expel the prime minister. A lot of folks are against it. Well, we found out on Sunday, mm -hmm. uh, in the wake of a lot of these protests, and, and seemingly unrelated, mm -hmm. that a notorious... Uh, leader of Al Shabaab in Somalia, that's a, an Al Qaeda affiliated militant group there, that it has, uh, that, that w a particular individual was killed right. on Sunday. And people are speculating that this could be an opportunity for Somalia, which has not had a government that is in control of its territorial space for almost 20 years now, mm -hmm. um, a moment for change potentially in Somalia. Yeah, it's interesting because. We saw a couple days ago, I mean, people have been sending us this story for many days, people taking to the streets with pictures of the Prime Minister who was at this uh, Uganda Accord, the Kampala right. Accords, you know about yeah, this. Yeah. Basically, they were saying that, you know, it was a power grab between the President and the Speaker of the Parliament to kind of oust the, the uh, Prime Minister, who a lot of people in Somalia view as someone who really has done a lot in terms of curbing terrorism, but also in terms of trying to promise and, you know, guarantee that there would be free and fair elections in Somalia after having a transitional government and a temporary government for, I think it's since 1991, they haven't had a, f a formal government. Well, it's, it's sad because the, um, you know, the impact of this uh, instability in Somalia has extended to a lot of different places because there's a massive Somali diaspora mm -hmm. that are basically living as refugees around the world. Mm -hmm. And we got tweets from Abdurazak44 on Twitter this weekend who was talking to us about some of the violence that's been perpetrated against Somalis and mm -hmm. what they're calling is a new form of apartheid in mm -hmm. South Africa and apparently people are finding that South Africans or at least they're claiming that South Africans are discriminating against Somalis themselves I mean th this is something that it's kind of new to us and we're going to be able to talk about hopefully a little bit more soon but in order to join this conversation and to hopefully give a little bit more perspective we've got a South African joining us on the set, Imran Garda yeah. of Al Jazeera. Welcome, it's a pleasure to have you here. Hey, man. Now, Imran, have a seat, make yourself comfortable. Yeah. We're glad to have you here because I'm going to be away next week and you're going to be taking over the I anchor's host. Big shoes to fill, what size are you? <laughs> well, they're, they're not that big, trust <laughs> me. We'll keep the size off the air, but talk to us a little bit about this possibility that within South Africa, are there still um, kind of racial and ethnic uh, tensions that transcend or move in different directions than the historical legacy of apartheid. Oh, of course, the historical legacy of apartheid has actually influenced the xenophobia that uh, many South Africans feel right now. Mm -hmm. And in a nutshell, 17 years since the end of apartheid, so many people can uh, go to vote at the polls. That's democracy for them, but they have little else. And what the mm. government has given them is a sort of sense of entitlement to say, um, you're gonna get better jobs your lot is going to be better, but many people are still living in townships without electricity, without water. Yeah. And the most convenient scapegoat has been uh, foreigners, yes. fellow black Africans 
who come to South Africa as the hub, like uh, perhaps many Latin Americans would come to the United mm. States yes. in order to make money for economic opportunity. Yes. They scapegoated, and a couple of years ago, I actually uh, I covered uh, some horrendous uh, xenophobic attacks against uh, Somalis mm. in uh, South Africa. It's not just Somalis, it's, it's Zimbabweans, Zimbabweans, Mozambicans, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the individuals that I'd actually covered had had uh, acid thrown uh, yeah. onto him, and, and he was set alight as well because he, he had a little shop in a township and he was making a decent amount of money. He wasn't yeah. wealthy at all. Uh, but, but those desperate, angry uh, South Africans living in the township, those that attacked him, felt that he was taking away their opportunities, taking away their jobs. You know, so, I, I was yeah. seeing a lot of talk about these kinds of activities happening against Zimbabweans last year when the mm -hmm. World Cup had come to South Africa. And there was some speculation that the South African government was trying to sweep these things under the rug in order to maintain their good image. Mm -hmm. South Africa is one of the shining stars of the continent. What do you think are the potential implications of this kind of xenophobia for the country's future? Well, I think most of the experts you'd speak to would say that, and, and ordinary citizens would say that, unless the root causes, i.e. poverty, and then of course poverty version 1.2 becomes crime, etc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless these things are properly addressed, xenophobia won't go away. And, and unless and until the government can actually start delivering to all South Africans, yeah. um, this is going to be uh, prevalent. And unfortunately, you know, they, the analogy is that when a man gets uh, fired at work, mm -hmm. uh, he can't really take on his boss, so he go, goes home and, and beats, beats up his, his wife. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's how these um, very fragile uh, um, African migrants are in South mm -hmm. Africa. Uh, bearing the brunt uh, in the townships, no doubt. Imran, I got to thank you for being with us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, We're thanks, looking brother. forward to seeing you here next week while I'm out of town. He will be hosting. Jillian, it's wonderful to have you. Hope that you'll join us again soon. Thanks. Ahmed, as always, it's great. Uh, thank you for joining us today in the post show. We will be back here again tomorrow. Definitely keep talking to us online. Tweet us at AJStream. We will see you on the web.